Good evening, everyone. This is uh, Justin Denton. I'm uh, uh, taking a moment to talk to you a little bit about what to do with your 3D printer. Our first series that we had last month at the end of October, we uh, spoke about what type of printer to select and what, to, you know, a bunch of different brands and, and how to select which one would fit your need and your budget. Um, and I'm hoping uh, you were, if some of you that maybe are attending tonight attended that session and were able to uh, use some of that advice to pick up a uh, great deal on a printer between now and then, maybe even some over this past weekend uh, during the holiday shopping frenzy that was online or even today during Cyber Monday. Um, but today I uh, wanted to talk to you a little bit. You know, we'll, we'll make the assumption that you have a printer or you have one on the way and you, you really want to dig into it and know, you know what to do with the 3D printer. I know some of that can be a little bit time consuming of a process. So I figured this uh, presentation would give you a quick jump start. So a little bit about myself. I'm Justin Denton, been in technology for uh, quite a long time now at this point um, and uh, about 25 years, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, try not to uh, think about it too much. It's been so long. Um, but uh, right now I'm the uh, Director of Support Services for Collegiate Education. We uh, provide managed services for colleges and universities across the globe. Uh, but also I own and operate uh, 3 Denton Auto by US uh, Vet Designs, which is a, uh, a uh, automotive design product firm where we use some of the tools that we talk about today to help develop uh, various products and we leverage 3D printing to help build some of those. So topic of today is, and we discussed it a little bit earlier, is uh, you own a 3D printer, now what? Um, basically, we uh, purchased a 3D printer, um, not for sure what to uh, begin with. Uh, there's a lot of information out there and we really wanted to talk about uh, how to find models that you can print out. Also how to design your own models. We'll talk about some of the various software to do that, as well as using the various slicer software applications. Some of the printers come with their own homegrown uh, software to actually take your model and print it out on your printer. Uh, we'll talk about some of that. We'll also talk about some alternatives as well. And then really what to do next after you've got your 3D printer. So in a nutshell, that covered a lot of my agenda. Uh, along with this, we'll talk through how to calibrate your printer. Uh, sometimes when you go to print, it may not look perfect. If you Google online, you can find some printers that have some very, very good uh, detail. Uh, the sides of your prints are nice and smooth, almost smooth as a something that you could go to the store and buy. Uh, and then sometimes you might find that your print's got blobs and, and strings all over it. We'll talk through how to troubleshoot some of that uh, with, with some of the calibration of your printer. Uh, and then also we'll go through, like I said, how to get models, software, 3D printing apps. Uh, we'll talk about where to get some training and how to's and then really talk about what's next after we've done all of this. So calibration techniques are, there's, there's quite a few. Uh, we'll cover just a handful. Uh, to keep this uh, presentation going. But for calibration techniques, a lot of it is, is really around making sure that you, when you say you want to print 100 millimeters of filament and send that through the printer, that your printer is actually printing 100 millimeters of filament. A lot of times out of the box, they don't print that way. Unless you purchase a higher end printer that's already been calibrated and tuned prior to you receiving it. Uh, a Prusa printer is, is typically one that has uh, already been tuned for the most part. If you buy one of the ones that are calibrated and pre-tuned, otherwise you can buy a kit, you can do it yourself. Depends on how much fun you wanna have. Uh, it could take some time uh, because you're gonna, you're gonna run a test and then if you don't like it quite well, you're gonna run another test. And a common test to be able to use is, is printing a bed sheet uh, with the link uh, in, the, in the slide that'll take you to a bed sheet download. And you'll run that, print it out, and then you analyze your bed sheet. You go online and you find other people's pictures of bed sheets and you determine whether or not that 
yours looks as good as theirs. And you'll find over time that uh, on the overhangs, there may be some, some stringiness or blobs. Um, you know, the print quality on the sides of the little boat that you'll print um, may have some defects in terms of the material in the actual printer may have slight hole or sorry in the bench you may have slight holes in it or have blobs of of plastic hanging off of it these are typically signs of at first uh, calibrating your your stepper motor um, so your stepper motor is is going to be where you need to measure and i've got a link it's very it's 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 a more of a process in doing this um, and that link is is uh, is a great link to show you the steps as well as the the actual gives you a calculator to make the correct calculations because you're going to have to update some settings in your printer. But in in short, when you're when you're calibrating your stepper motors on your printer, this is the motor that controls the feed of filament that goes through the hot end on your 3D printer. Uh, and basically, you met you load your filament in like normal and then when you want to start to test you go from the very base of your filament so where it's where it's right at the top of your extruder and measure down the filament 100 millimeters or of you know it's, it's best to do it in millimeters because you print in millimeters so take a caliper uh, like the one that's in the picture uh, and measure off 100 millimeters of filament and mark that. And then from there, click on, uh, or sorry, from there, you, you've measured off 100 millimeters. Then you go into your settings on your printer and you can, you can extrude from your settings menu. Uh, depends on where it is, but you'll preheat your hot end through the menu on your printer. So your printer will be up to temperature for the correct filament. So let's say you're using PLA, you'll want it to be somewhere around I like to use 205 to 215 for my PLA. Uh, and then you will, in your settings menu on your printer, say to print 100 millimeters. Usually it's the extrude 100 millimeters or extrude, extrude 100. Uh, most of the time you've either got a touch screen or a dial. So that would be, uh, depending on your brand, it may be pushing a button that says extrude 10 millimeters at a time. So you'll hit that to you extrude 100 millimeters and then or you'll use a dial and dial it up to 100 millimeters depending on what printer you have and then once it extrudes the 100 millimeters you measure the remaining filament before it gets to your 100 millimeter line that you marked if that line that you marked is no longer there then you and, and it's right even to where you started with the 100 millimeters that means you're for the most part on dot and you and you don't have to worry about it if it's gone past that line too much and extruded more than what you needed, then you, at that point, you kind of got to guess how much more because you don't have a line to work off of anymore. Um, so say you tried to extrude 100 millimeters and instead of 100 millimeters, it extruded 110 millimeters. So uh, run that calculate through the calculator on that link and it will then tell you what you need to change in your settings and then you you need to go into your printer uh, and connect up and change the setting in your printer and then do it all over again until you get to the point where when you extrude 100 millimeters it extrudes that whole 100 millimeter line and stops where you can still see the barely see the mark that you made of 100 millimeters i probably slightly simplified it it's actually a little bit more time consuming process than that but uh, when, when you do need to calibrate a printer, it can take, uh, don't get discouraged because it can take a good hour or more sometimes, depending on how bad out of calibration it is to get your calibration right. Sometimes it only takes, you only have to do it once and you're good and you're, and you're, you're set. I've had a few printers in the past where when you say to extrude 100 millimeters, uh, there's, some, there's some hardware differences where uh, even though I thought I had it all perfect, it's still extruded either a little bit more or a little bit less. But one of the steps, it's a very critical step too, that'll help steer you to a better quality print when you get done. 
uh, along with that, I skipped over this, uh, but your, your first layer is very important. Um, I got a picture down at the bottom on this slide where if you are doing a first layer, your first layer uh, needs to look like what it says for good. I mean, worst case, it can, be, it can be a little more on the low side, but if you start to go on the high side of that, uh, your print typically won't stick and it'll disconnect in the middle of the printing. So if you have an issue where you've got a printer and you're printing and it always, the print falls off and you're either slapping a bunch of glue on or you're putting some sort of tape down or you're always having, having to print a, a what's called a raft on your print to get it to stick. A lot of times it's just your layer that's that needs to be adjusted, your first layer. Uh, you can adjust that by going into the Z offset. And it's more of a trial and error, unless your printer has a, a Z calibration uh, tool built into it. Um, it may not, but not a problem though, because you can go into the Z offset and if you need to go a little higher because it's it's scraping into your bed, digging your nozzle into your bed, then you need to go into Z offset. It's usually under advanced settings on your printer. Uh, uh, usually you go into settings and then advanced settings and then there's a Z offset value. Uh, most printers are defaulted at zero. Uh, if you print at zero and you're having problems and you wanna make it go to a negative value, if you're printing and it's digging into the print bed, you wanna go into the more positive value. It, it adjusts your print head in like hundreds of a millimeter. So if you significantly need to adjust, you'll need to crank it up. Uh, so it'll be like a 1.5 or 3.0 or something like that, where it's doing a three millimeter. Uh, and so you'll have to spin your knob quite a bit because it does a hundredth at a time. After you've got your first layer perfected, you've calibrated your step, your stepper motors um, and you know you'll want to adjust your filament settings in your slicer a lot of that is is you'll you'll find that printer filament is very variable they will tell you that it's a 1.75 millimeter filament or a three millimeter filament or a 2.85 millimeter filament if you have a micrometer it's probably the when you're 3D printing is probably the one of the best tools to have around. Uh, it's about, you know, up no more than $10 on Amazon. And it'll allow you to measure the thickness of your filament. This is where you want to adjust your filament settings. Uh, in, your, in your slicer, which we'll talk about a little bit later, there is a setting for filament size. Usually it defaults to 1.75 or 2.85, depending on your printer, either if you've got a regular printer or a Lulzbot or an Ultimaker will be the 2.85. Um, that, that's your typical default. They do that because if you buy your filament from those manufacturers and you buy Ultimaker filament or you buy uh, a Lulzbot recommended filament, usually those are spot on. So when it says 1.75, it means 1.75. If you, if you get a caliper and you go out and measure your filament, you'll find that most, there's a lot of filament manufacturers that say they have 1.75. And even in this picture, it's 1.74. Uh, some I've seen vary all the way down to like 1.6 and so forth. And there's going to be some major uh, differences in filament. Uh, so, what happens is, is when that when that occurs, you need to go in and adjust the filament size and go from there. Uh, so if you if you find out the filament that you're using is a 1.74, 1.73, adjust the filament setting in your slicer to match what type of filament you're running through, and then go from there. You'll know that if you if you're swapping between a bunch of different filament that it may be beneficial to check this periodically uh, because if it's a slightly off, it's not going to cause any problems with your, your actual filament per se. Um, but if it does, then you want to adjust this setting. So common things that you run into is that, um, 
is that it'll your print won't look perfect. So after you went through your first layer, you calibrated your stepper motor, and then you've calibrated your filament settings, and then then you you should be in a fairly good spot. There's some minor tweaks that you can do at that point, and we'll get into those. A lot of, a lot of stuff on calibration, uh, a lot of useful links. Uh, definitely take advantage of those. Uh, let me go to the so. When we get to this, uh, you know, we talked about calibrating. That should get you in a good spot where you can start printing some some nice models. And and really, you want to figure out where to get these models. There's a ton of different places to start with. Um, there is a bunch of uh, sites like Thingiverse, Yegi, CG Trader, Colts, Prusa, Free 3D, STL Finder. Um, all of these sites are great sites to go in, find your first models download them, and then start playing around. Get them printed out, run them through your, your printing slicer, um, and, and really, really you know, start making objects that you can do something with so you can feel like you've uh, got a 3D printer and are somewhat useful with your 3D printer. But after you've exhausted that and you're like, hey, I've built a bunch of stuff uh, from other people's designs, I'd like to design my own things, uh, then, then you really want to get into that using some design applications. So various design applications that you can use are going to allow you to either take somebody's model um, that you found online and modify it, and then you can adjust that modification to, to allow you to do something different. Uh, sometimes I, uh, I, I'm building my own model and I'm having a difficulty you know, making the right top to it or maybe making a curve that I'd like through my design application. So I'll find somebody's design where they have a curve on theirs that I really like and I'll, I'll edit their design to take a piece and add it to mine to make an adjustment. I like doing that when I'm making household products uh, for my house, uh, you know, cabinet pull handles, um, uh, you know, you can make shelf uh, brackets. So I, I built out an entire shelf system in my 3D printing area. That's all based on 3D printed shelf brackets. So there's a, a lot of things that you can do and then you can modify them to make them your own. Um, otherwise, spend time uh, and, and look into using some of these applications here uh, to just design something from scratch. It'll take some time, so that's why they, there's a whole training component to this webinar. It, you'll need to do some research and, and figure things out, but I, I would recommend Tinkercad as the first because it's totally free and you can jump in and start learning how to build out your own design uh, from, uh, you know, I've, I've like yesterday, I went into, into Tinkercad even uh, because it's quick and easy and get the job done. Uh, and built out a, a little housing for my speakerphone that I'm talking on right now. I have a USB speakerphone, uh, a Jabra uh, speakerphone that's hooked up to my computer, and I wanted to amplify the sound a little bit better. Because, you know, when you got a basic speakerphone on your computer, sometimes the audio isn't uh, the best, uh, and you can build out your own enclosure uh, that allows you to amplify the sound coming out. Uh, didn't change any speakers or anything, uh, but allows me to uh, get a little more audio out of a, a device that probably has a speaker the size of an inch or two. Um, so it's a, it's a great way to do that. Uh, if you need to go into more complex designs, uh, something like Fusion 360, SolidWorks, 123D Design, Onshape, SketchUp, those are all uh, help ensure that you can get some more elaborate designs created. Uh, along with that, uh, you could you could get into using a 3D scanner. Uh, there's some apps for your phone that allow you to bring up a, a 3D scanner uh, to scan objects and then convert them into a printable object. And you can then load that printable object into one of these applications to modify and build out a really nice, uh, you know, cleaned up model that then you can print out. So. Uh, I've seen some people use even models of themselves using their their phone's LiDAR scanner and scan themselves into their phone and make it an STL file, then move it over to another program and clean it up. Although, depending on what apps you have available, 
or and or what you want to spend for the app, uh, there are some that are, are quite elaborate that you can almost go from running the scan to printing it out without even having to clean up the design. Um, so we're, we're talking about how to print them out now. And, and that, that kind of leads me into the next portion of this presentation is, is really um, using a various slicer apps. So your slicer apps are really the, the tools that take that 3D model you design and break it down into individual slices that then allow you to print it out. As you, if, you've, if you have a 3D printer and you're using it right now, or if you've seen a 3D printer, it prints it layer by layer. Uh, the purpose of these applications is to take something that's more of a solid 3D model and then break it down into that layer by layer creation mode and then send those instructions to your 3D printer to print each layer individually. Those layers are uh, uh, obviously a setting within your printer. So layer height is a setting itself. Um, a typical 3D printer has like a 0 0.04 millimeter nozzle and you can print I don't, wouldn't recommend printing exactly 0 0.04 millimeters in height uh, because you'll, you'll be pushing a, a lot of filament out and your printer may not be able to keep up with it, but you can do, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.15, you know, point, uh, you know, two or something like that and, and be able to keep up. Once you start pushing a lot of filament out, you typically need to upgrade your printer to handle a large amount of filament coming out at a fast rate of speed. Uh, they have to upgrade a print heads that allow you to do that. I have one print head that will let me push out uh, almost the entire width of a 1.75 millimeter filament uh, for each layer. It'll do up to 1.2 millimeters at a time. And I can push 1.2 millimeters of filament out, uh, which is almost the full width of a 1.75 out as one individual layer and keep building upon that. Um, so it's definitely possible, just some additional options. But when you're looking at using various slicer tools, there's some advantages and disadvantages to various tools that are out there. Most popular is, is Cura, uh, Cura because it's 100% it's free and they continue to evolve that application over time. Uh, Prusa Slicer, if you have a Prusa printer, is great. Uh, it also has some support for other printers as well. Uh, I personally, you know, love Prusa Slicer for my for my uh, my Prusa printers. Uh, the models that I slice through it come out perfect. They and if you use filament that they've already built out all the profiles for within the slicer, uh, you don't even have to tweak anything. You just Load your model up, select the appropriate filament, select your printer, have it slice it, and then move that file over to your printer so you can print it, and it comes out perfect every single time. Uh, when we talked about the filament profiles just, just there, the reason behind those is some of the larger manufacturers partner with the software manufacturers to give them the exact printer settings that are the most optimal slash ideal to be able to print their filament. Uh, you'll, you'll find, like we talked about earlier, the discrepancies between the width of filament it varies greatly. Uh, the temperature settings and uh, the retraction settings and a lot of other uh, settings within the slicer programs also vary with some of the filament. Uh, I've learned this over time because I've went with buying bargain filament and sometimes that bargain filament becomes more expensive because it gets it catches it, gets a, it catches on and, and people start buying the bargain filament and drives the price up as laws of supply and demand. Uh, but I found that you know by doing that, I'm always constantly changing my settings to be able to print better. Uh, or I find you know bought some bargain filament and the the print quality is just or, the, print, or the, the type of filament is just wildly uh, horrendous. Uh, and when, when I say that is, is when you use your uh, caliper tool to measure the width, sometimes I buy 1.75 filament. And if it's, it's really junk, um, you'll, you'll find that the 1.75 filament may actually you know, take a foot long string or let's say a five foot string 
And you know, one end measures 1.75 perfectly. In the center, it measures 1.78. And on the end, it'll measure 1.65. There's, there's just no quality standards on some of the manufacturers. You'll, you'll get burned once in a while. I'd say once you find a printer filament that you like or a brand that you like, just keep buying the brand. Uh, it, it stinks because right now the price of filament goes all over the place. Um, before, at the beginning of 2020, you could pick up uh, rolls of filament, uh, of Overland filament, which is a, which is a pretty, pretty popular brand on Amazon. And it prints out really good quality. They were selling for about $10 a roll. Uh, about in the middle of this year, April, May, June timeframe, that same filament went up to $25 to $30 a roll. And I think right now they're finally coming down closer to the $20 range, $18 range. Uh, so it's you know, the price fluctuates almost like it's the stock market on, on filament. I think a lot of it's been going on with what's going on right now, but uh, it's something to keep in mind. Once you find the brand, you'll just have to keep in mind that I will, I will pay that price because uh, some of that filament that's more uh, not quality can also have impurities in the filament, which then lead to uh, what we'll talk about in my next presentation, basically how to repair your printer, uh, because some of the filament won't actually be pure PLA or pure ABS. It'll be mixed with other product, and that product will melt as well as the primary uh, ingredient, like on PLA. And when you are printing at PLA settings, it'll cause your printer to jam up inside. Uh, the filament will get won't melt, and it'll get clogged in your nozzle, and you'll have to clean your nozzle out. Uh, so there's there's uh, some also long-term benefits of using the same brand on the printer. Uh, that helps ensure that you're not running into all these other issues, like repair, having to tear your printer apart to fix your print nozzle and stuff. But otherwise, there's, there's all these other brands. They're all various prices. Uh, I'd say my top three are Cura, Pura Slicer, uh, or Prusa Slicer, and, um, and Simplify 3D. Simplify 3D does cost a little bit, but it slices things lightning fast, has a lot of options that I, I personally like, and supports just a wide variety of printers. Uh, I was skeptical about buying it when I did buy it. I think it's like 100 or 150 bucks for a, a software. Uh, but I did purchase it uh, because I have two XYZ DaVinci printers and the software for those uh, are is less than stellar. And I really needed something that gave me some more options uh, since they're a more of a proprietary design. Uh, most people did not support those printers, but Simplify 3D did. They had the proprietary, put the effort in to handle the proprietary design of that printer and be able to generate the special uh, G code or, or you know 3D printer code that allows it to print to those printers. So another option, I would say use the free ones first. Uh, if you like them, get into a more advanced version. And then lastly, once you've started doing that, let me go back to the slide one more time, um, is using a tool like Octoprint. Octoprint is a, a great uh, application uh, that runs, or basically it's an operating system that runs on a Raspberry Pi that allows you to uh, connect a, a little Raspberry Pi device up to your printer and I can sit in my computer and print directly to my printer. And I'll, I'll do a quick live demo and show you what Octoprint looks like in just a few seconds. So some common settings uh, with, with slicers is that if you are building out your design, you wanna print things, these are some common settings that you may wanna adjust along the way. Uh, a lot of people uh, typically run into issues with 3D printers, and I would say this is the most negative experience that it can be is they'll purchase a 3D printer and they won't get their temperature correct. So if I, I use ABS or PETG, but I'm using PLA print settings, the material won't go through the printer and then it'll get clogged up in the printer. And in all reality, it'll give you a really poor experience because you'll think you spent all this money on a printer and then it gets clogged up and it's not working. 
uh, again, alludes to next month's presentation where we'll talk throughout actually repair all that. But the net result is, is people typically have this experience and they return the printer because they think the printer's junk. Uh, and in all reality, it's just a, a confusion point on how hot they should get the print head to be able to print. Uh, I've picked up a few of these broken printers in the past and, and all I have to do is crank the temp up, clean out the nozzle, and I can print with it myself. So first, the key thing, making sure that you've got the right temperature. Uh, if you, depending on what slicer application you use, that'll help ensure you get the right temperature. Uh, I like to crank it up just a little bit more than what the slicer application uses, uh, just to be on the safe side. It doesn't usually degrade your print quality. Um, so another one that you can play around with, just don't swing your temperature so much that it dips below, I would say these ranges, these are really safe ranges to keep your printing in. Uh, your, your next one would really be your infill pattern or your infill and your, in, your percentage of your infill and your pattern. Um, your, when you're doing your infill, uh, if you don't do enough infill, it may cause a poor quality print. If you, if you print too much infill, uh, you may just be wasting a lot of filament to create something. Uh, I, I don't think I would ever recommend using 100% infill unless you're looking for something to be insane strong. Um, otherwise, if it's just printing models for your desk or, or just printing some basic stuff, you can usually do, you know, 20 to 60% infill and get away and have a really nice product. Uh, especially if you're using something like ABS or PETG, uh, you don't need 100%. The, those, those materials are inherently quite strong and can withstand a lot, even at lower infill settings. Uh, and then when you talk about pattern, there's the differences, and that's the top left picture on this slide. Uh, your your pattern for infill, uh, depending on what you're printing, you just you pick one that you like. I typically uh, go with grid, or in Prusa Slicer, it has its own Prusa pattern. Uh, that's that's quite nice. Uh, otherwise, you know, Honeycomb or one of these others will will, will work for you. Uh, I I. Usually pick one of these and go with it. That that works for my uh, design. Uh, it's just something that more personal preference. Whatever gives you a stronger uh, design structure on what you're printing. Uh, something that you may print something that has a very strong design if you use grid, but if you use triangular, for some reason it's not as strong. So test them out. My personal preference. I use rectilinear or grid or or full honeycomb. But otherwise, I, I usually keep the rest. Uh, I don't usually even use those. You also have your layer settings. Uh, we talked about that earlier. Your layer settings are really going to be how much detail you want your print to look like. Uh, the picture in the bottom right details out what layer settings would look like. On the left, it's a, it's a lower layer setting. So something like a 0.1 millimeter or 0.15 millimeter. Uh, and on the far right of that picture, that would be one where you're printing out at like a 0.2 or 0.3 or even maybe a 0.4 millimeter. Uh, it's extruding a lot more material and then going up to the next level. Uh, the difference is, is from quality to, to rigid, rigidity. So uh, on the left, you're going to have a very quality print. It'll be more detailed. You can get a, a lot more detail in that print. On the right, it's not going to be as detailed, but it'll allow you to print way, way faster. So rapid prototyping, um, as well as the typical prints when you print at a very thick layer, you're extruding so much material on top of more lines of material that it becomes very, very strong. Uh, so options to use plus it you know you, you make it quite quick then uh, so something that I would print at a you know, 0.15 or 0.1 millimeter uh, layer height versus something that I would print at let's say you have a nozzle that'll let you do 0.8 millimeter the 0.8 millimeter will print uh, in, in an extreme amount of time it's not eight times faster but it's at least I would say uh, three to four times faster than the high resolution version Another one, if you find that you're still having problems, you've made those adjustments earlier in your calibration settings where you've adjusted your layer height, you've uh, adjusted 
uh, your filament diameter and you're still having problems with your print sticking, I know you can still use uh, your tape. You can use uh, some adhesive on your, on your, I like glue sticks. Uh, the best thing to do is go buy glue sticks after school has started. Uh, most stores stock up on glue sticks before the school year. And then after the school, after the school year has started, they throw them all on clearance. That's when I go and buy my glue sticks. So you can go get glue sticks really cheap, lay a little bit of layer of glue sticks down and that'll help your print stick to your printer. Uh, but sometimes, you know, you may get some warping or something like that. And that's when you would want to use something like a brim, a raft setting or a, uh, or use, uh, you know, in some instances supports, depending on what you're printing. If it has overhangs that your printer's un incapable of printing, uh, you can use supports to make sure that it prints those and then you just break those off. Uh, so there's some additional settings that you can use. And then um, your extruder settings. So in the bottom left, it talks about your, what's your, what's your diameter of your nozzle on your printer? Uh, you know, like I said, most ship with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle. I have an extrusion, extrusion multiplier that typically varies uh, depending on whether you have, are using ABS or PLA, uh, depending on the application that you're using, it will auto adjust that for you. So you don't have to mess with it, but sometimes you need to either bring that value down or bring it up slightly. It's not a lot. It's usually like either 0.9 or one, or maybe 1.1, depending on the filament, but it's another one of those settings that you can tweak to help better your quality. A couple other quality settings are your retraction distance and, and your retraction speed. Uh, if you find out that you've got some stringiness when you're printing, um, it could be a couple different things, but one of those could be your retraction settings. So you can adjust how quickly the filament pulls back up when it switches to a next layer, as well as how far it pulls up uh, when it switches between the next layer. Uh, that helps ensure that you're, you know, you're not stringing filament all over the place. Otherwise, it could be that your filament's bad. If it has moisture in it, uh, then you want to look up the best way to help clear moisture. Typically, they tell you to stick your filament in an oven and bake it for you know 20 minutes or something like that at a very low heat setting at like 80 degrees, 100 degrees. Um, but just validate uh, what what option works best for you. Uh, I don't think my uh, wife would appreciate me taking a bunch of my plastic filament and sticking it in our oven and baking it in the house because uh, you can imagine there is going to be some fumes that come because of that. Other, other slicer settings, these are more um, additional settings that you can utilize to help uh, change the look of your design and maybe help tweak some settings. Uh, ironing is a great one that will put more of a, a slick finish on your print. As you can see in the top, normally when you print something, it's got some layer lines across the top. It's, a, it's got a little bit of rough texture to it. Uh, and if you use ironing uh, in Cura, uh, it will smooth those out as much as possible. You know, it's, it's not gonna be like a brand new, you know, store bought and plastic item, but it, it's, it's gonna give you a nice touch. Um, to find all these, keep in mind, I don't have a, all the settings displayed. Um, but to find them, if you're using something like Cura, which is a good starter application, you can go into Cura and, and bring up the advanced settings. And in Cura, then you can just search for these. You just type in ironing or iron, uh, Z-seam alignment, retraction, and so forth. And it'll bring you directly to that setting that you can modify. Uh, Z-seam alignment is if you have uh, an item where for some reason you just have these random dots or, or, or missing gaps within your print. I find these in these in weird, I guess, not vase-like objects, but maybe like spiral type designs where I need it to be filled in. So I can't use the spiral design within in Cura, but I found out that to fix that, I use the Z-seam alignment. By default, it tries to automatically hide the seam. Um, but if you do not have uh, rigid faces on the design. It's, it's more of, a, of, a, of an abstract type design. Sometimes the slicer doesn't know how to handle that. So it'll just randomly put dots where it was transitioning to the next, next uh, layer. Um, and to be able to get rid of those and or minimize them into maybe one string of, of dots, 
uh, is using Z seam alignment. So what that'll do is it'll allow you to just put a, a seam in one spot. So if you've got something, you can put it on the back side of the spot uh, on, the, on the design. We talked about layer settings earlier, um, but there's also speed, height, width, uh, settings that you can do. Um, adjusting layers uh, is our basic height where you put 0.2, but you can also do your layer width uh, and, your, and your speed of your layers. Uh, layer width typically is, is always the size of your nozzle, so 0.4, uh, and then speed, uh, that's how fast you print. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's nice that our printers advertise they can print at 200, you know, millimeters per second or, or something of that nature. Uh, it's not always uh, realistic uh, because when you print that fast, the quality suffers considerably and or even though the printer says it can do that, it never usually can keep up. Uh, so we, uh, I, I recommend on some of these printing at lower speeds especially PETG, one of the one of the more problematic uh, uh, issues with filament is PETG and to be, be able to be successful with that. I found that, you know, one, to get my first best layer, I have to print it like crazy slow. I'm printing it like 10, five or 10 millimeters per second for my first layer to get it down right and not have it peel up or ball up uh, on the print. And then I print at about 20 to 30 millimeters per second. Um, to print my design. That allows me to have a great quality design and not have to worry about uh, the problems that are inherent with PETG filament. So PETG filament is very stringy. Uh, and if you don't watch your settings properly, uh, it'll, it'll just get strings of filament all over your print head and make everything nasty. Uh, and worst case scenario, I've had one where I started it up, it looked like it was going well, and then it detached and then just melted PETG all over my print head. And once that stuff dries, it's near, it's, it's, a, it's a chore to get it off your print head without breaking something. The first time it happened to me, which was also the last time it, it busted my print nozzle and the heater element in it and a, a couple other things uh, when it happened. So I had to replace my whole hot end when that happened. But, you know, lesson learned, uh, just, just, play with your speeds a little bit. Going super fast isn't, even though it's nice and you wouldn't get it done fast, uh, it, can, it can run into some issues. So I figured I would show a quick demonstration uh, of going into Thingiverse, downloading an app uh, or uh, a file, loading it up into Pruce or Cura Slicer, we'll use Cura, and then, and then I'll show you how to upload it into a, my Raspberry Pi on my actual printer. Um, so I'm going to end the show right now. We have a couple more slides after that, but I figured I could demo this really quick for you. So I've got my Cura Ultimaker up. It's connected to my, uh, or it's set up to uh, slice against my Anacubic Chiron. And I also have my Raspberry Pi uh, connected with uh, OctoPrint, and I can access my, Cura, my Chiron from here as well. So I, I'm going to go into Thingiverse. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to search for anything super fancy. I'll just grab something that's highlighted on the main page. But Thingiverse, you can search. It's got a good search tool that allows you to find almost everything you want. There's hundreds of thousands of, of designs on here. It's become exponentially popular over the last couple of years. So uh, a couple of years ago, they didn't have a whole lot of designs. Now there's just uh, hundreds of thousands of designs on here. But I will pick, uh, let's just pick something easy because uh, let's just go with these hands, this will work. At times, like you said, seen uh, Thingiverse's page can get really slow. Uh, depends on time of day. I don't know. Uh, there's been rumors that they're still running on this really ancient server. Um, I think those are just rumors more than anything, um, but Sometimes it's decently fast, but most of the time it's just, it can be very slow. So be patient on this website. There's a lot of people that go to it. So I found my design. You can scan through here, look at the various pictures. Uh, depending on who designed it, some people are quite helpful and also give you the print settings and recommendations on how to print the design. <laughs> this is a great way to ensure you're, you're doing the same thing they're doing. 
because they built the design, they should be the expert on how to actually print it. So for this one, they're using a Creality Ender 3 printer, which is a quite popular model. They're also telling you, you don't need to put rafts or supports on your print on this print. You printed a resolution of 0.2. It uses 15% uh, infill, which is perfect. So for this design, all I need to do is download it, throw it on my slicer. I don't need to tweak much and I'm ready to print. So let's download this file. Get the uh, automatic timer. All right, I'm going to save it. Give me a second. And I'll go into my downloads really quick. All right. Okay, so I've got my files. So when you download it, when you extract it, you typically have a license file, a readme file. Uh, it'll show you some of the rendered images that, that are also displayed on the web page. But you typically want to go into the files folder. And that will bring up the, the actual model file. It would be perfect if I could just print this from this point, um, but uh, you can't. You've got to bring it into a slicer program to prepare it for your printer. Um, so I'll, I'll go into my Ultimaker Cure application and do a file open. Grab this and just drag and drop it. Sorry, I'm on a Mac. Uh, for those people on Windows PC, it's very, very similar. Um, when I open this, it'll show me the hand. Uh, it's quite detailed. Um, so to get this level of detail, obviously, we, we learned layer height is key. Uh, if we want detail, we need to go slow, and we need to have a low layer height. Uh, if I go up here, my layer height, I can see is at 0.2 millimeters. Uh, and, and this is uh, one of the odd things, is 0.2 on one printer isn't always, doesn't yield the same quality as 0.2 on another printer. If I ran this in 0.2 on my Prusa printer, it would print just like this. If I run it at 0.2 on, I have an mono price ultimate, it will not look like, it'll, it won't be as quality as this. I'd have to run it at like a 0.1 layer. On my Chiron, I found that 0.2 works really, really well on my Chiron. So I typically run everything at 0.2 millimeters. Great thing with uh, Prusa Slicer is I have this drop down here. I can change my, my settings to high resolution, normal, draft. Obviously, the we've, we've also talked about the the lower the resolution, draft quality, uh, it means lower quality print, but it will print out a lot faster. If I'm designing something and I'm not quite sure if I got my measurements right uh, and I want to do a trial fit, I will design it and then run it through as a draft quality print just to get something out really fast and then make sure it fits. If it fits, awesome. If it doesn't, I can tweak it a little bit and I can print it out if I'm confident at that point. I'll print it out at a higher resolution. If I'm still not confident on my next reiteration, I'll print it out as a draft again. And sometimes, you know, that takes a few times of trial and error and then eventually get your design perfect and then you're ready to start producing it at a high quality print. But for the Chiron, even though it says normal, it actually prints, you know, fairly high quality even at that level. Uh, we talked about some of these other various settings. I'll show you where you can type in uh, seam. And I can, I can show that I, I like using a Z seam. Um, so uh, you do the sharpest corner and you hide your seam. That's usually your default settings. Sometimes I do user specified. And if I use specified, then I set what point on my, on my print where I, where I want the seam to be. Uh, and I can set that right here at the X and Y access points. But I'll do it at sharpest corner. Uh, when that happens on something like this, you may find out that you need to specify it uh, because there really isn't any corners on this print. Uh, but it's one of those things. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go with this one for right now. Normally, I would do a user specified. I will set this at zero. I'll set this at like a 200, which will hit one of the points on the bed. And then that at that access point, it'll run the seam right up the print uh, and, and be good. We'll just leave that for there.
click X. Cure is again a little slow on this computer. Uh, it, it's definitely processor intensive. So if if you find that it takes a while to slice your prints, or it takes a while to transition between pages on Cura, uh, it, it, it's probably your just your computer is a little slow. Uh, it, if it still works, it works. Then you're okay with how long it takes. No worries. If you want if you want to run faster, you may need to upgrade your computer. Uh, other settings we talked about, you know, the bottom pattern. Uh, this is your top and bottom pattern. It's good for objects that have a flat bottom and a flat top. You can change this to lines, concentric, zigzag, and it just basically puts a different pattern on the ends. Um, infill pattern, this is where we talked about the grids and the triangles and so forth. Uh, zigzag is always a, a good one to use too um, for this one. We'll, we'll, we'll actually flip it over to uh, a grid. Uh, sometimes you'll also find out that uh, depending on what object you're slicing, switching the infill pattern may also give you a little bit of a, a bump in actually how fast it is created as well. And so many settings in advanced mode, but this is a great mode to be in. Uh, to be able to show you all these settings. Don't go hog wild and play with all the settings. They're just nice to be there. Uh, and if you're not comfortable with the advanced mode, obviously you can leave it on the default mode where it's not advanced, which is the recommended mode. Uh, but I like playing in the advanced mode because uh, you can make some tweaks. Again, maybe do that after you've played with your 3D printer for a little while. Uh, and this is where your retraction speed is. Uh, and then for this one, we'd normally, uh, maybe need supports. For this one, we don't need supports if we follow the recommendations from the actual individual that designed this. Uh, so I, I, can, I can add supports. Uh, I usually do zigzag supports. And then I also modify the support line distance to four millimeters or three millimeters. The default is one or 1.5 millimeters, which makes your supports really close together and sometimes a, a little bit difficult to detach from your print at times. So I can, I can get a little bit further out support line distance. It doesn't affect my print quality and it makes it easier to remove supports. Supports can be the bane of your existence depending on what you're printing because uh, first few times I used supports when I first started this, I went to break off some port supports and I actually broke my print at the same time because uh, some supports can attach quite well, especially with PETG. We also talked about build adhesion, even though he didn't recommend any type of build adhesion. If you know that you now this print bed is on its last leg and it nothing sticks to the print, then you'd want to throw a brim on it. Uh, and then sometimes I also adjust the brim line count to make it go out further. If I know I have a print that is very prone to warping at the bottom. Uh, and basically warping means is when you print this first layer, while it's printing the rest, the bed heat may actually cause the print to detach in a corner and raise up off the bed. So when you get done with your final product, most of your, most of your creation looks good, but then there's this weird bent up spot that looks like someone melted it, which is just belt, melted plastic. Um, so increasing your brim line count can help ensure that doesn't happen because inevitably even sometimes using brims it can still warp it just it minimizes that risk so we've made some modifications uh, and we'll go ahead and hit the slice button and this is where you'll see it slowed down um, this is a more of a detailed print so as this slices it's taking its own time um, and not that it's uh, bad or anything, just the more detailed prints will take some time to slice. Uh, Speed-wise, we're still only talking a few seconds. If you have a very, very elaborate design, uh, you may find that it will take a considerable amount of time. Uh, let me close this print settings window, and I can see that it gives me a rough estimate of how much filament it will use. It's going to use 175 grams or 58.81 meters of filament. And then it'll also take roughly 14 hours, uh, almost 15 hours to print this. Those are all approximations. Uh, I don't know if I've ever seen these to be exact to the minute. Um, sometimes when they get to the printer, it'll slice it up and it'll take a little bit longer. Um, but it gives you a good idea how long this is going to take. So I'll hit save to file. 
I'm going to I'll save it on my desktop. And then uh, let me uh, let me bring grab the file real quick. And I'll throw it over here. Okay. So this is what it'll look like is now I have this the G code. So we started with an STL file and now it created a G code. G code means that it's basically ready to, to be able to print. Um, depending on what type of printer you have, you couple you have a couple different options. You have the ability to copy this to an SD card, copy it to a USB key, and then go over to your printer and then insert that into your printer, browse from the print file op or print file option on your printer and print that file that way. Or, like I said, you could use OctoPrint. OctoPrint allows you just to use a web interface. And the way this works is I have a Raspberry Pi that has a USB cable that plugs directly into my printer. That Raspberry Pi sits on the Wi-Fi network. And then I, I just connect to it through a web browser. When I have my file ready, all I have to do is just drag and drop it. I drag and drop it over to this uh, file or this folder. and, and I'm running this in Raspberry Pis. Uh, you can buy them. Uh, usually you'll see them for 30, 35 bucks, maybe $40. But uh, this one, and you'll see it's a little slower. The reason why it's slower, it's, it's one of those Raspberry Pi Zeros. A Raspberry Pi Zero, 100% uh, works with OctoPrint. It's a little bit of a slower uh, device for uh, 3D printing. Uh, and, and only really in the instance of it, it may slow down your print slightly. It may take a little bit longer. It's, it's not really that noticeable. Uh, the only time it's noticeable is when I'm uploading a file to it. And as you can see here, it's continuing to upload. It's going to take a while to upload. So uh, we'll, we'll skip over this portion because it, it can take multiple minutes to upload. Uh, that's the only delay that's a little annoying. But uh, I mean, I've been able to buy Raspberry Pi Zeros for $5 at Micro Center or, or various hardware places that throw them on sale. Normally they're closer to 10, but it's a great way to get into this and get into it fairly cheap uh, and get the job done. It uses a micro USB power cable that you can usually plug into uh, any leftover USB, uh, you know, plug-in that you have and it'll run on hardly any power uh, so I usually buy those they're cheap I have a couple of them running right now and when I have more money to, to purchase I'll buy the I'll buy the other Raspberry Pi so good way to get into it so I will know this will run once it's ran uh, I can I can I'll show you what another file looks like I can click on uh, let's click on this fake walls one I can then click on a file here. Um, I'm not connected to my printer, but I would just basically click the print button here and it will start printing to my printer. And, and I'm good. I can monitor it from here. Uh, I don't have my camera connected, but I can do a live stream. If I have a USB camera connected to my Raspberry Pi, uh, I can watch the G code as it prints layer to layer. Uh, and you can send commands through terminal, a lot of different options, a lot of different plugins. So, Great advanced options there. I'll flip back over to the presentation. We'll continue on and we can wrap this up for everybody. Um, so we've talked about a lot of different options, a lot of different softwares. We've seen some of that software in action. Um, really now it's like next steps. Uh, a lot of 3D printing is uh, learning on your own I've found. Uh, there's a there's some definitely a bunch of resources, but there's also some trial and error. I know where I live and, and even in the Chicagoland area, if you have your printer and it's broken, uh, it's 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 one of those scenarios where it's good luck finding someone that can fix it for you. Uh, I learned that early on and, and understood that I'm just going to have to figure out how to repair these myself. So I spent a lot of time uh, fixing and getting frustrated and learning how to repair things, doing a lot of searches on the internet, reading a lot of forums. And along the way, I've found that there's some great websites that you can reference to get additional information for 3D printing. Uh, one, check your manufacturer's website. Uh, your manufacturer, depending on who your manufacturer uh, of your printer is, uh, some have some really, really great forums. Lulzbot, Prusa, 
uh, I believe Ender may have some good forums out there that are hosted by the manufacturer. They give you a lot of detailed information, a lot of training videos, a lot of how to's, and, and that's where I've found a lot of good luck with. Um, next, if it's with your slicer program, you, your printer manufacturer may have some great slicer documentation as well, but if not, uh, go to the manufacturer of the web of the slicer that you're using. So if you're using Ultimaker Cura, go there. They'll have a bunch of videos and how to's on that site. Uh, you're going to get it from the people that design the application, so you're going to get it by the book, uh, but it's really, really great information. There's other sites like Instructables or All3DP. Uh, those have a lot of additional how to's, tips and tricks, uh, and how to take your, your abilities with 3D printing to the next level. Lynda.com, if you want more formal type training, uh, Linda still offers uh, some great training tutorials on 3D printing. So to complement what we're already doing here, you can do even more. Um, YouTube videos, there's 3D Printing Nerd, uh, Chep, Ivan Miranda, Makers Muse, Make. Uh, these are all people that have been in the 3D printing industry for quite some time. Uh, they have some great background. They do a lot of great printer reviews, testing, uh, torture tests. Uh, I like Ivan Miranda a lot because he just, he, he builds really, really out there stuff with his 3D printer. Uh, like. A, uh, a tank that he could drive around in and uh, large cannons that he can shoot massive nerf darts out of. Uh, so a lot of, lot of cool things that you can learn and it kind of get your mind going. If you're in a kind of a creative funk, uh, you can get into these websites and get some ideas to help, help you design something new. And then as always, you know, I find a lot of my times on Google. Uh, if I, run into some errors on my printer that I couldn't find anywhere else. I'll do some Googling to find out how to fix them. If I'm having a weird issue, like right now on one of my printers, I have a weird issue where it prints. It's a Lulzbot Taz 5, and it just started happening over the weekend. So it's very, very relevant because uh, I haven't troubleshot it yet. Um, but it'll print about five, 10 layers. And then all of a sudden it, it, it like hiccups for some reason. And then it, it stops printing uh, and then and it stays in one layer for a little bit and then eventually steep keeps going up. And so it almost gets paused at a middle layer for some reason and pauses there and starts printing the same layer over and over again um, for four or five layers without moving the print head up and then eventually moves the print head up. So uh, a, another one I'm going to have to troubleshoot and figure out uh, and see what I want to do with that one. But these are great tips on on how to get to that level. Then what's next? You know, we've, we've went through a lot. We've talked about um, various software that we can use, design, how to get some files, how to print those files, uh, get training on how to continue to get better with this. I would say if you haven't already, make sure you print your first model. Um, that's going to get you, you know, your first step. And I'll tell you a lot of things when you print your first model too. You'll determine whether or not your printing quality is is poor or is it good? Is it is it is it you know acceptable? And also allows you to determine you know if I make some tweaks, this is what my baseline started at. So make some tweaks. Make sure you keep that first model so you can compare it for your models down the road. I always keep uh, my all my first designs in a cabinet just so I can kind of compare and see the evolution of my designs as I go. More of a more of a pet peeve. Um, Maybe buy a, a Raspberry Pi and, uh, you know, use Octoprint. Give that a try. Uh, you know, create your first design. Uh, go into Tinkercad, if anything, which is really easy, and, and start making a design. Even if your design is a cube with a, with a cylinder on top, it's a good start. Uh, give that a try. Uh, and then next is post-processing. So sometimes... Your print quality, you may just find that you can't get it tweaked to be 100% perfect, or you want to get your prints to be like their store manufactured, then there's, there's post-processing. If you're using ABS, you can do uh, use acetone to help smooth out your print and uh, look up how to do that. It basically uses the fumes of acetone to smooth the ABS 
out a little bit, um, sanding and, and filling with either Bondo or something like that will help you uh, get a better, smoother print. Uh, annealing your print, uh, that's a cool term in terms of certain filaments like PLA Plus or PLA Pro uh, or even uh, PET-G, you can anneal. And what annealing does is basically you're baking a print in your oven at a specific temp. Again, you're baking it somewhere around 80 degrees Fahrenheit and it hardens your print makes it even harder and makes it more temperature resistant. So one of the common properties with PLA plus is when it's in, uh, uh, you know, when it's in heat uh, or extreme heats and extreme heats can be only 80 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, it can, it can tend to warp. Um, so you can anneal it in your, in your oven or a toaster oven and it will harden the print so it won't warp anymore. Um, annealing basically melts those layers together slightly and causes them to fuse stronger together. So your end, end result is a harder, more temperature resistant design. Uh, sometimes part of the annealing process, uh, for warning, your print may shrink a little bit. It may not even be noticeable. Uh, and sometimes it may change color. This is all dependent on the filament you're using. Uh, but it may change color. Therefore, you may find that after you anneal something, you may need to sand and fill it, and then you may need to paint it. Um, so a combination of all of the above may, may be what you need to do to get to your end product. Uh, it's very common. People constantly are printing things and refinishing them and putting the designs out. So this is a great way to do that. That's really it for this uh, session. Uh, I want to personally thank everybody for joining. I know we had uh, uh, quite a few attendees tonight. And uh, the next presentation I have is, is talks about how to maintain your printer. That's when we dive in on how to replace motors, how to test motors, how to, how to, re, how to clear out filament, and basically do some teardowns. So I will pause. And if there are any questions, feel free to ask those in the chat. And uh, I'll be more than happy to answer them. If there are no questions, uh, I would be, I wish you a great evening. Uh, can I print onto things like wood or a vinyl album? So uh, the, I would say the, the uh, PC answer would be no, you, sh you shouldn't try it. Um, but to be 100% honest, you, you probably could. Uh, it's it's going to be more advanced. So when you do a 3D printing on something uh, other than your bed surface, this is where you need to adjust your Z offset. So uh, I, would, I would put that item on your print bed. And, and for those that aren't comfortable with it, please don't do this, but I will, I'll give you the advice. Uh, you can lay that item on your print bed, level your print bed with that item on the print bed, and then that will be your baseline print bed. So you're basically re, you know, removing your print bed out of the equation and you're gonna be printing on top of that object. You may need to adjust your Z offset, may to do some bed leveling with it, but you could in theory do that. But I recommend it, probably not. You, uh, you're basically gonna print a piece of plastic on top of another item um, that you may or may not wanna do like, like on a, a vinyl album, unless you just wanna use the vinyl album as a base and have a infused 3D object on top. But yes, it's possible. There is some advanced, you know, you're gonna have to tweak some settings and you may have to remember after you do that, you're gonna have to tweak them back to your normal print bed. Uh, but possibility is yes, you could. Otherwise I would say you wanna do like laser engraving or something of that nature. Thank you, Brian. If there's any more questions, feel free to ask. Otherwise, uh, I thank you all for attending. All right, looks like uh, looks like we're good. I will. Uh, I'll go ahead and uh, wish you all uh, a great evening. And uh, thank you again. Remember, 
to try to check out the uh, December 28th uh, event. And it'll be really good in terms of trying to keep up and maintain your 3D printers.